unthinkable and unspeakable. Unquote. This omnipresent, eternal, and boundless principle, referred to by Madame Blavatsky, is said to be similar to the notion of the pre-Big Bang void of modern physics. Both physics and theosophy suggest that everything has arisen out of complete emptiness, the stillness of the infinite, undifferentiated space. That being so, you see, then that void or that emptiness is not really empty, except in the sense that it is no thing, but it's actually the plenum as well. Because within that darkness of everlasting space lies the potential for everything that is, for everything that can ever be, and that includes you and it includes me. Now, if that is the ground of our being, if it's the source of everything, if it's that to which we want to turn our attention, the ultimate good, the real, the eternal, the one, why does H.P. Blavatsky say it's unspeakable and unthinkable? I think there's at least two reasons for that. First of all, it's the nature of our mind. Our mind understands or knows by contrast, isn't that so? We can know black because there's white. If we're in a train moving along, we know whether we're moving or not by the contrast, don't we? And sometimes we get confused and we think, oh, we're moving. And when we look more closely, we see that the other train is moving. So we know that we're moving by contrast. If we were absolutely alone in the universe, if that were possible, and you could still be quite peaceful and happy and content and alive, which of course is quite impossible, but let's imagine that it's possible, and there was no other thing, no stars, no sun, no nothing, how would you know whether you were moving or standing still? You couldn't, could you? There'd be no wind, no breeze, no movement. You're immobile. You see, our mind knows by contrast. Now, in that undifferentiated, eternal, boundless, infinite space before the universe comes into existence, there is nothing, no existence, just eternal non-being, which yet somehow mysteriously is the only being. And so we can't think about it or speak about it because every word we use is a contrast, isn't it? The second reason, I think, that it's unspeakable and unthinkable is uh, perhaps best seen by an, by an analogy. Any eye, whether a human eye or an animal eye, any eye at all, I think I can safely say will never see itself. It will see itself only by reflection. There may one day be instruments so magnificent that we can look into them and see every subatomic particle of our eye. Wouldn't it be fascinating to do that? But what we're seeing is not our eye, is it? It's the reflection of our eye an exact image of the reality, but not the reality itself. This eye, therefore, will never see itself. And in that same way, you and I will never know the ultimate real because we are it, in that very same sense. Now, the great mystery is why did this background void or ultimate reality spring into existent being. Why did that happen? When HPB was asked that question by a student, she said, don't ask me, ask Parabrahm. And Parabrahm is the Hindu name for that first fundamental proposition, the ultimate unspeakable vast reality that nothing can be said about. It's a kind of unanswerable question why. Yet, from our limited human point of view, I think we can say perhaps this. It appears to be its nature to do so. And there is nothing in the universe that can violate its own nature. We are what we are. We can't be giraffes if we're humans. Now, while we can't say too much about the why, 
I think we can say something about the how. And the secret doctrine does make an effort to tell us some aspects of how this universe comes into being. How from the undifferentiated, unmanifested one does the many arise, including you and me? The secret doctrine asserts that the universe comes into being by a process of polarization. Imagine that the screen in front of you represents the eternal, undifferentiated reality referred to earlier. Within this void, a fundamental polarity arises. On one hand, there is the subjective side of the universe, and on the other hand, its objective counterpart. We might think of the subjective side as unconditioned consciousness, or spirit, while the objective side can be called the root or the possibility of matter. From this polarization, a strange kind of tension is said to exist between the two poles that might best be described as abstract motion. So according to the secret doctrine, these three aspects, spirit, the root of matter, and abstract motion, are the bases for all existence. And these three are one. In Hinduism, it's thought of as the great breath. So the non-existent one, which is that undifferentiated, unspeakable space, has now become the existent one, because now we can say something about it. You see, it has three aspects. It has subjective, objective, and motion. There's something to say and to consider with our human minds. But it is still one. It isn't stuff.